Hello and welcome back to This Week in Global Health or TWIG. TWIG is a weekly live global health news roundup. This week we're going to be talking about water and the importance of water in the global health space. And the reason for that is the 22nd of this month, which is the 22nd of March. I actually had to ask everyone earlier what, what, which month we were in actually. I've, I've, I've lost track of my life since I've, um, I've now got a one month old son who keeps me up at night. Uh, this week, 22nd of March, is World Water Day. So we're going to be talking about water in this what, week's episode. What? <laughs> We've got some people for water in the background there. Uh, before we carry on, I'm going to ask the team members to introduce themselves. I'll start with myself. My name is Greg Martin. Um, and just a quick reminder, uh, if you're watching this live, uh, you can you can interact with us with the hashtag twig on Twitter. We'll see those tweets, and in the discussion section at the end of the show, uh, we'll respond to any questions and comments. Okay, next up, Jessica. Hey everyone, I'm Jessica Taff and I'm coming to you from the Washington DC metro area. Today I'm going to be joining the discussion about World Water Day, which is awesome. And um, I'm going to be giving you a research update on what's new in that area of, uh, of the, you know, of global health. And also I want to remind our viewers that if you prefer to listen to our talks, you can totally do that through our podcast. You can find us on iTunes or you can go to our webpage and you can stream directly from there. That's www.twigh. So find us there. twigh.org. Dot org. Goodness gracious. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> no problem. Um, okay, thanks very much, Jessica. Next up, Christopher. Christopher. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Every single time. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Chris slash Christopher Ronson, coming to you from San Francisco today, San Francisco, California. Uh, I will be going over the relationship between water and health, as well as a couple of different opportunities in the space, uh, and maybe reminding Greg about my name again a few more times. Let's see. <laughs> Are you, are you oh, and I'm sorry. I did want to mention too that for those of you who are watching this live or even not live on YouTube, you can go ahead and leave us your questions or comments in the comment section below the video. We check them all the time. We interact and engage with you guys, and we'd love to hear what it is you have to say and your thoughts on all of the different things that we discuss. Chris, you used to go by Christy, which was simple, and then you changed to Chris, and then that just naturally became Christopher. So, you know, I, I, I absolve myself of any responsibility for that wrongdoing. It's evolution. It's evolution. <laughs> okay, next up, Susan. Hey, everybody. This is Susan, and I'm speaking to you from North Carolina, United States, and today I'll be talking about water and gender equity and water and innovation. And also, like, uh, you know, if you want to reach out to us, you're all, you can also reach out to us through email by... Uh, emailing us at hello at twig.org. Okay, hello at twig.org. You can get us, and we will reply to any emails that come our way. Okay, we're going to jump right in, and we don't have Johns Hopkins, the, the Global Health Now uh, team, giving us a news update today, but Chris is going to step in and give us a news update. Chris, over to you. <clears throat> Okay, hi everybody. Once again, like Greg said, Johns Hopkins Global Health Now gives us all of our news updates when they cannot be here. A big thank you to Brian Simpson and to Dana for their uh, help this week. Uh, we're going to start off with two water-related stories. The first one is just that when people think about sort of uh, lack of access to water, especially clean water, they think of low and middle income countries. And it's important to understand that water woes are not just uh, relative to LMICs. Now, according to a recent article in the Texas Tribune, nearly 90,000 people, and this is an approximation, uh, living along the Texas Mexico border are thought to live without access to running water. So that's a really interesting statistic because I think it's not something that people consider a lot of times uh, in both high income countries as well as high and middle income countries. Um, up next, a really important transition uh, to show the relationship between water and climate health is a story on Cyclone Pam. Now, Cyclone Pam slammed into Vanuatu last weekend, and residents are reporting uh, water and food shortages, and aid agencies are really struggling to fill that need. This is a Category 5 storm, so it's extremely dangerous, and it's affected over 130,000 people so far, which is nearly half the, red, or half the country's population. Uh, Vanuatu's low-lying coastal islands have been deemed particularly vulnerable to disasters and uh, rises in sea level. Now, one additional fact about this story is that, according to the BBC, people in, uh, on a remote island to the northwest have resorted to drinking salt water, which is a dangerous practice that can lead to severe dehydration and death. So. So, uh, Chris, did you say that that was a Category 5 cyclone? Yes, it was. What, what is that? Do we, yeah. do we know what that is? Do we know what, a categ what Category 5 means? A I really think pretty bad much one. everything is categorized on wind speeds. And so this is one of the most severe and extreme, I think, both in terms of like the side effects of the storm itself, but as well as the magnitude uh, and the strength of the storm. 
So I don't know what the actual worse than gradients are, though. It's worse than Category yes. 4. Do we know how, how, like how high that goes up? I, d I don't. If you'd asked me these questions before the show, I could have researched it <laughs> for you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Well, let me let me cut in and just say that you know I'm glad you bring this up because I think it's also important to talk about how water is related to emergency responses. Everyone needs water to survive, but besides the fact like public consumption of it, Pete, you need water to clean wounds, you need water to clean instruments. So much waters are important for the emergency response. You need um, patients that like people probably don't even think about patients that are on dialysis. You know, you need water to run these machines. So. I, really important and that's one of the first things that like they're going to need in the response. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thanks very much Jessica. Thanks Chris for your update. Now, we've got a new section that we're going to build into each show if we can. Uh, as well as our news update which you've just heard, we're going to include a science update. So just an update on research and science that's happening in the global health space and Jessica is going to give us our first science update. So Jessica, over to you. Right, okay, so we're talking about World Water Day um, and so what is new in this area? Um, well, a study published this month in PLOS One looked at improving water treatment, which is important because you need sometimes you have to treat water for it to be clean. So they were looking at uh, improving water treatment in low-income urban settings. Now, since in a lot of these settings, intermittent supply and low pressure make centralized treatment difficult and therefore less effective, um, they carried out a study in which they examined how passively dispensing chlorine at hand pumps compared with distributing water disinfection tablets, which is also combined with behavior promotion in Bangladesh, fared. So, comparing these interventions, after 10 months, both interventions resulted in over 70% of households with chlorinating drinking water. But it's important to note that the usage of the tablets fell by 50% after behavior promotion visits concluded. So that's important. So, you know, the tablets were great, but only because people were visiting and saying, hey, you've got to use these tablets and whatnot. So, however, what the study does show is that automated and decentralized water treatment shows promise in low-income urban settings as opposed to what's normally done, where it's a very centralized water treatment system. Okay, super interesting. Thanks very much, Jessica. Right, next up, we're going to ask Chris to talk about water and health. Chris, over to you. Thank you, Greg. And I would also just really quickly like to say, based on the, uh, the follow-up to the news story, a Category 5 uh, tropical cyclone is actually anything with wind speeds over 157 miles per hour, or for those of you on the metric system, 252 kilometers per hour. So it's pretty intensely severe. Um, now, to move on to water as health, here's an interesting fact that I don't think it sort of helps quantify just how serious of a problem this is. Um, what kills more women than AIDS and breast cancer globally? Well, the answer is dirty water. And despite all of the progress made with the MDGs, or the Millennium Development Goals, of MDG 7, in the last decade, 748 million people still do not have access to an improved source of drinking water. Contaminated water is known for transmitting diseases such as diarrhea, cholera, dysentery, typhoid, typhoid polio, and it's estimated to cause over 500,000 diarrheal deaths annually. Now, return on investment for universal access to improved sanitation and improved drinking water is high, and studies show that for every U.S. dollar invested uh, in into a WASH program for water sanitation and hygiene, you'll get approximately a return of 5 to 28 US dollars, uh, basically back in GDP, I think is what we determined that the, the output was. So this is uh, really interesting you mentioned that, Chris, because dirty water, like you said, is also the root of problems of maternal and child mortality. Um, with so there was a recent study uh, they did that they did at Stanford University in which they found that cutting 15 minutes off the walking time to a water resource could reduce under five child mortality by 11% and prevalence of nutrition depleting diarrhea by a whooping 41%. So that's, you know, numbers, evidence is right here. Water is important. <laughs> the evidence is right there. Thanks very much, Sulzan, for that extra intervention. And that actually brings us very neatly to our next section. And Sulzan, you're going to talk to us about water and gender equity. Absolutely. Water and gender equity. Who would have thought? How is that related? So um, in many countries, it's the woman's job to get, go and get water. And uh, that's uh, very interesting because when you look at, uh, uh, there's a 25% of women's day is spent collecting water. That's 200 million hours a day. And that's a huge op opportunity cost um, with time spent not generating income and not going to school. 
So that's where, you know, you need access to water to even improve gender equity and improve opportunities for women. Yeah, and of course this then leads to one of these self-perpetuating cycles. So if a woman has to spend most of her time collecting water, she doesn't get educated, she's unable to get a high paying job or any kind of employment, and so she slots back into a role of collecting water and, and using her time that way. So I mean, we see this in, in terms of gender roles and disadvantages and unfairnesses uh, that we see in society again and again. Thanks very much, Susan. That's tremendously interesting. Next up, Chris. Chris is going to talk to us about water and food. Chris, okay. over to you. So the relationship between water and food is one that I think a lot of people think are obvious. We think of water as being necessary for growth and agriculture, but I don't think a lot of people take into consideration just how much water it takes to put food on the table. Um, now, did you know that you would need 15,000 liters of water to produce two steaks? This goes into the grass or the grain that is used to feed the animals and the water used in all of the treatment. Um, this year as we discuss sustainability of our water resources, let's not forget that food insecurity and water insecurity have a very clear relationship and dynamic between the two. Our dietary habits and uh, our population dictate water consumption based on what we tend to eat more of and what we tend to eat less of. Now the shift in diet from a starch based to a meat and dairy based reason is uh, one of the primary reasons for our greatest impact on water consumption in the last 30 years. There's been a huge, huge increase. I know a lot of people have heard about paleo or just, I mean, even the general shift towards a more meat and dairy based diet has been detrimental to our water systems. And by 2050, agricultural communities will need to produce about 60% more food globally, which will hugely impact how we use our water resources. So that's something to take into consideration when you go about your day and just think about societally, population-wise, community-wise, uh, the foods that we choose to eat. Yeah, thanks very much, Chris. And I, this, is a, this is a stark reminder of the fact that, you know, in 2008 and, and since then, we've seen one or two of these food price shocks. And so we, and we know mm -hmm. that as food prices, particularly staple starches, if they shoot up, people that spend a large proportion of their income on food land up really suffering and people of course die and food is is you know the ability of a country to produce enough food for its population is is intimately connected with its access to water we know that there are some countries that are dipping into unsustainable water tables and i think uh, china is one of those and mm. you'll, what what we may see is a situation where china lands up not having enough water to produce the n the crops necessary to feed its its domestic population but it'll be a wealthy country so it'll simply buy in the food, which means that food prices will shoot up and the people that will suffer are likely to be people in low-income countries and particularly the poorest people in those low-income countries who cannot weather um, uh, food price shocks uh, in any shape or form. So it's all it all comes down to water. Thanks very much, Chris. That was really interesting. Next up, Jessica is going to talk to us about water and urbanization. Jessica, over to you. Right. Well, that's important to bring up because a lot of people don't think about it, but water is connected to urbanization. For instance, today, one in two people on the planet live in a city, and the world's cities are growing at an exceptional rate. Four people moved to cities just in the time that I said this. And projections show that another 2.5 billion people will move to urban centers by 2050. So providing access to safe water resources in urban areas is a real challenge, and it's going to continue to be a challenge. And thousands of kilometers of pipes are integral to that, but so many of them are so old, and these piping systems waste more water than they deliver. So, like I said, water is definitely connected to urbanization, and it can be a challenge in some of these these uh, in the in growing urbanization. Interesting stuff. So, four people moved to a city in the time that you said the beginning part. How how many would have moved? You know, by the end of the episode, thousands, thousands, and hundreds of thousands. Sorry, I'm just I'm I'm going on a tangent. Sulzan, talk to us <laughs> about water and innovation. Absolutely. So water is innovation. Now we're talking about access to water and urbanization. And although access to improved water resource has reached 89% in many countries, it's still a dismal 64% in sub-Saharan Africa. And that's a huge uh, opportunity for innovation. And innovations such as that of sachets of drinking water in Nigeria is a high demand alternative that will not only contribute to sustainable access of portable uh, water, but also spur growth of small businesses. So there, you know, water can also mean innovation. And, and Solzan, let me jump in and just say, um, th mention this really cool innovation that I know you're familiar with. It's the, uh, funded by the Gates Foundation. It's called the Omni Processor. And basically, it is a steam power plant, incinerator, a water filtration system. It takes raw sewage and converts it into electricity, clean water, and clean ash. Um, and the electricity and clean water communities that use this, they can sell it, and they can use the ash as fertilizer. So, I mean, it's a, definitely a 
fantastic innovation that it can promote um, access to clean water in the future. Super duper Absolutely. interesting. And were you saying, uh, Jessica, that there's a YouTube video with Bill Gates drinking water oh. that was ma was was cleaned yeah. uh, from using the system? Okay. Well, we'll try and find a clip of that video and stick a, a link to it in the show notes because I think that's super interesting. All right. Uh, moving right along. Last item for today, Chris is going to talk to you about job opportunities in the global health space that relate to water. So this section is called Water is Opportunities. Chris, over to you. Okay. So actually, and this is a really good transition from the innovation that Jessica just spoke about because opportunity and innovation uh, are very closely intertwined. Now, there are a lot of organizations working uh, in WASH, and some of these organizations are currently hiring. Ones that we want you to be on the lookout for, there are two. The first one is called Securing Water for Food. It was launched in Stockholm and is supported by USAID. And it's uh, right now they're doing a grand challenges for development seeking RFPs or a request for proposals to accelerate innovations to produce more food with less water. Uh, in addition to having their third call for innovations, they are also looking for a communications and research e-interns. So again, through USAID, the communications person will deal a little bit more with advocacy and their social media accounts, while the, uh, the research e-intern will help evaluate these grand challenge for development concept notes. So we're going to have links to both of those jobs and a little more information about the call for innovations on, uh, on our website as well as in our show notes. And I'm going to turn it over to Solzen to tell you a little bit about the second organization that we are highlighting. Can I just today. quickly ask, what is an e-intern? I think it basically just means that you can do the job remotely. For the uh, research one, they're basically saying there's five hours of training in May and then about 20 hours a week in June when they actually start looking at all of these concept notes. So I, it's, it's one of those things where you don't have to pick up, move, and then not get paid to live somewhere else okay. <laughs> to do a job or get some experience. So well, it's ideal is what we're saying. Internship with Craig, <laughs> let us know. We're looking for e-interns. <laughs> we do, always, so, always, especially if you've got graphic design experience. Perfect. So the, another organization, like talking about internship uh, and uh, WASH, is another organization to look out is WASH Advocates. Now it's a non-profit, non-partisan initiative which was dedicated to help th solve the world's global, you know, safe drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene problems, and so all the WASH challenges. And this organization is hiring. They're looking for a communications manager to strengthen their presence as a resource for our sector. We'll have the details in our show notes. And, uh, yeah, that's uh, the end of Water is Opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Susan. And as always, remember, we will have links to everything we talked about, so everything from the article that uh, Jessica was – and I think, Jessica, that was an open access article, right? So that was plus one. Right, so, so it'll be an open access article. We'll have the link in the show notes. You can read that article yourself. Uh, the links to all the jobs that we talked about, that'll be in the show notes, of course. Um, thanks very much, everyone, for watching. If you're watching this live, don't go away because we're going to go into a section on, on uh, questions and answers and comments to, to what came over Twitter. But um, if you're watching this on YouTube, this is the end of the show. Thanks for watching. Don't do drugs. Always do your best. Don't ever change. Speak to you again next week, same time, same place. Take care.